Welcome, everybody. It is 9 o'clock. Good morning. Thank you. John. Well, thank you all for being here. For those of you online, welcome to you too. We're glad you're here with us. My name is Marty Miller. <laughs> Just kidding. My name is Doug Dobbs, and uh, apparently I don't look anything like Marty Miller. Thinking maybe it's the glasses? I don't Anyway, I'm substituting for Marty this morning. Uh, Marty and Deborah are traveling this weekend and uh, visiting family somewhere out in West Texas, so I'm not sure where. But we sure hope and pray they're having safe travels and a good time, and we look forward to seeing them again next week. Today is April the 18th. You know what that means. God, <laughs> I knew it. I knew somebody would know. Today, henceforth, shall be known as the day of the return of the donut and coffee. So we're looking forward to that. If you're visiting with us, uh, we're sure glad you're here. And what that means is we've moved our Bible class start time up to 9 o'clock now because our norm has been, previous to COVID, to have a little fellowship between Bible class and worship service at 1015. So we've got lots of donuts and coffee and tea. If you're visiting, go out these doors to the left, follow the people, and visit with us. We sure like to meet you, and we're glad you're here. And if you're on a diet, don't worry about it, because we have donut holes. Right? Research has proven there are no calories in a hole. So uh, you can have 20 or 30 of those and a cup of coffee, and you'll be fine. All right, two apologies. First of all, you have to put up with me this morning. Marty does a tremendous job, and I've always enjoyed his classes. He just is unparalleled in his Bible knowledge and his applications. And his classes are something we always look forward to. So you're stuck with me this morning. That's apology number one. Apology number two is I don't have any slides this morning. I'm sorry. I like slides. But uh, in putting all this together, I really just kind of ran out of time to get those together for you. So maybe I can pretend I'm clicking up here. and <laughs> We'll change the slides as we go. I asked Marty about doing Deuteronomy, because Deuteronomy was next up in line in his agenda, but uh, because of some unexpected travel and so forth, I think he wants to rearrange some things. So he suggested that I just do something on faith and obedience, which is what Marty has been doing. You remember he began with trust and obey, and he quoted the lyrics to that great song. Faith and obedience tied together with that. So I want to do a little bit on terminology this morning. Um, I'd like to speak just a few minutes on how the world sees us or defines us, which is very wrong. And then I have a case study. So in line with what Marty is doing, we'll have a case study as well. In the Greek, faith and trust are, I guess I could call them cousin words. Uh, they're very similar in pronunciation and very similar in spelling. Pistis and pistos, P-I-S-T-I-S, P-I-S-T-O-S. That's faith and trust. And both can be synonymous with confidence. And it's always been a challenge for me. As I was thinking about this last week, it's a real challenge to sort of distinguish the two. I mean, what is the difference between faith and trust? Right? I think in the most common usage, faith is going to be the noun. When you possess something, you have something, faith about something. While trust we tend to use, and while trust can be a noun, of course, uh, it seems to me we more often than not use trust in the verb sense that follows that noun, in this case, faith. And I'm getting somewhere with this, so hang on. In other words, we have faith, but we prove that faith when we trust or when we act. I mean, which is easier for you? Or is it the same to have faith in God or to trust God? What do you think? About the same? Faith easier, harder? For a lot of folks that I've talked to in the past, and I think for me too, I think faith may be a little easier because the evidence of God's creation is overwhelming. And that's what we talked about last week. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there's so much evidence to support that. But to really trust to hand it over to God is kind of the opposite of the way we handle things sometimes. 
It makes it difficult. We have all these struggles and all these responsibilities, and we try to handle sometimes things all by ourselves. To choose to put your trust in God, I think, can be a challenge. But that trust will come when faith becomes action, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. We'll be getting to a case study in just a bit, but I'd like to say a few things about faith. And I saw this again on the internet uh, just last week. There are many definitions if you look up the word faith. Uh, this is how the world defines faith in some places. Faith is a belief that does not rest on logical proof or material evidence. Faith is a belief that does not require evidence or proof. Richard Dawkins once said, faith, being belief that isn't based on evidence, is the principal vice of any religion. Otherwise, blind faith. As a Christian, I don't know what blind faith is, do you? I don't know what blind faith is. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes here, out in right field, and then we'll come back. But Dr. Dawkins, I would say, doesn't understand that faith that isn't based on evidence would be evolution, macroevolution. That would be the vice of the Darwinist. I know that blind faith exists, faith without evidence, is actually the faith of an atheist. When you specifically and scientifically analyze evolution, and I said scientifically, it has no starting point except for the claim of a single simple cell. Science has proven the universe had a beginning. How about that? It took them 100 years, about 100 years ago they figured that out. It took them a long time. And what did we know from last week? All along. In the beginning. We had a start. Absolutely. And the claim of a single simple cell is impossible because there is no such thing as a single simple cell. It doesn't exist. Even an amoeba or a bacterium is highly complex. It has life directions in it that are specific to a purpose and it is directed by a complex machine that chance cannot produce. In other words, Cells have a designer. They're specifically designed, and they're very complex. Doesn't surprise us, does it? The blind faith of an atheist believes that something comes from nothing. That's against all rational thought. That is not reasonable. The blind faith of an atheist believes in transitional forms of animals that don't exist. They have never been found in the fossil record. And you know what? As we read last week, they're never going to be found, are they? Not going to happen. That's because Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that we dealt with last week, or read last week, and Marty was teaching, is fact. It's not fiction. Next time you go through Genesis 1, 2, look for the word kinds. Do you notice last week how many times we talked about kinds? specifically created in those kinds. Evolution would have you believe, and the atheist, because those really do to uh, tie together, that they leap between kinds. And again, no evidence, never been found, and we know it never will be. And the irony of all of this is that science is actually proving that. By the way, transitional animals, even if they tried, could not survive the mythical transition, they just wouldn't survive. So, why am I doing all this? Well, it ties in very nicely to last week, our beginning, the creation of the world. And I just wanted to give you a nod here. I haven't been here yet, but there's a group out of Dallas, and it's the Institute for Creation and Research. Has anyone heard of the Discovery Center in Dallas yet? Not yet, right? I bet not. No? Anyone been there yet? It opened up just prior to COVID. Uh, and it's in Dallas. I think it's on Royal Lane, so you know it puts it somewhere between Dallas and Arlington, up on that west side. And uh, it's a big center that this ICR group, Institute for Creation Research, has built. And it looks like a lot of fun. But these are scientists. These are PhD types, you bet. But they believe in God. 
and they believe in Jesus Christ. And so that may be something when you're going up to Dallas, you know, they got the six flags, they've got all kinds of things to do in the area, or if you're traveling through to maybe make some time to check it out. Let me know what it looks like. As soon as I can get there, I'm, I'll let you know what it looks like. But the whole idea is that we have a natural museum now, in a way, that's based on truth. So think about it. Uh, there's a planetarium, uh, all kinds of exhibits and workshops for adults and for children as well. And I don't work for them, so I'm <laughs> but I've seen that, and I, I, I think it's a, something we may want to put on our agendas down the road. But that's what I'm trying to point out about this, though. This group, science basically, and good science is not a bad thing, by the way. It's discovering what God has created, right? Uh, but from this group and other places, archaeology, the fossil research, which is biology, physics, astrophysics, more and more, the earth and the heavens are telling us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you know, the Bible is all we need. And I just want to, in case this seems a little off track, uh, the Bible of course, is all we need. The first three evidences we need are the Bible and the Bible and the Bible. But there is a lot for us to use in this world today that's confirming that God created the heavens and the earth. And we, it's okay to use reason and evidence. As a matter of fact, it's actually biblical to use reason and evidence. I mean, Jesus tells us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. God speaks through Isaiah saying, come now, let us, what? Together. Reason together. Exactly. Peter urges us always to be prepared to give an answer. Paul commands us to destroy arguments that are opposed to Christianity. And even notes that Christianity is false if the resurrection of Christ is not an historical fact. 2 Corinthians 15, 14, 1 Corinthians 15, 14, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Faith in God is a reasonable faith. Now we all know very well what Hebrews 11, 1 tells us. Uh, you can probably quote that as easily as you can. Genesis 1, 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. Take a look at those words, perhaps for a second time. What does assurance mean? Assurance is a statement of conviction, a guarantee, freedom from doubt, a certainty. That's assurance. Blessed assurance. Conviction is a fixed or strong belief, a state of being convinced. Now we use those words. God uses these words in Hebrews 11.1. In the ESV and the ASV, the Holy Spirit tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In the King James and the New King James, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The NIV that we use a lot here at Woodland Oaks, uh, it's a good translation, a very good translation. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I like how the King James puts that, the evidence of things not seen. I mean, after all, what convinces you or convicts you of anything? The evidence. If you put those three verses together, just from those translations, and they're all correct, it's a powerful faith that we have in Christianity. The faith is the assurance, the substance of things, the assurance of things, and a confidence in what we hope for. It is a conviction of things, the evidence of things, and assurance, very strong word, about what we do not see. There is no blind faith in Christianity. So another way of looking at faith can also be expressed or defined, I think, into two kinds, or maybe it's two levels. But we do this all the time in our lives, if you think about it. In John chapter 20, verse 31, it is written, but these are written. And that's referring to signs that Jesus did. So, these signs that Jesus did are written that you may believe that, key on that word, that, 
Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in, key on that word, his name. So, but these signs are written, what Jesus did, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Christ, and that by believing Jesus is the Son of God, Christ, you may have life in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There's a difference in believing that and believing in. Belief that, when you think about it, is more a matter of the mind. Belief in is more a matter of the heart or the will. Now we have to have them all, don't we? Love the Lord your God with all your mind. I believe that. And all your heart. I believe in that. When you have faith in, guess what? That's when you will act. So here's an example. Maybe this pulls it all together. <laughs> when I was very little, have you, has anyone ever asked you this question? What is your first memory? Yeah? You kind of play a game with it sometimes. What is your first memory? If you really think back, what is your first memory? It's, probably, it's changing for me the older I get. But what is your first memory? I have kind of a first memory. I'm not certain if it's actually my first memory. But it's very early. I don't know how old I was. I wasn't in school. I was a little boy. And we used to travel. And when we traveled, the place to stop at and, and spend the night was the Holiday Inn. That was the place with the big green sign. And they built kind of a big U shape, with two stories. They had a restaurant you could actually order food in. Well, we looked forward to that. Apple pile of mode. And right in the middle was this huge swimming pool. And of course, whatever, when you were done for the day, the first thing you did is you put those swimming trunks on and you jumped in that water. Well, I couldn't swim, so this is what I'm talking about being kind of a first memory. I just have this snapshot in my head of my dad in the deep end treading water and me looking at him and him telling me to jump in that deep end. And I couldn't swim. And he wanted to teach me not to be afraid of the water. He wanted to teach me how to swim. But I just have that snapshot as clear as day of him treading that water and kind of moving over to the side and taking some deep breaths <laughs> and swimming back to the middle and looking up to me and saying, come on, Doug, jump, jump. And I wouldn't jump. And he kept treading that water. And he had this great big smile, and I see it as clear as day. I would not jump. I had faith that was my dad. I didn't have faith in that water. I was afraid I'd drown. And he kept telling me, jump, jump, jump. And I did. And I jumped in. Here I am. Everything went well. There was some splashing and a lot of laughing and so forth. Trust me, jump, he would tell me. Come on, jump. That's faith and trust. Of course, I knew him. That was my daddy. But I put my faith in him when I trusted him. It took a while. I had faith. That was my dad. But I also had to have faith in him or I never would have jumped. So we've known that all along, haven't we? Faith will lead to obedience. Believe that, then in that you will act. Now you know I'm going to talk about Hebrews 11. One of our favorite chapters. Hebrews 11:7 7 is all about faith and action. God saved Noah and his household, but Noah had to act. And he had to act to specific instructions. Hebrews 11, 8, 9, 17, faith and action. God made Abraham the father of multitudes. But he had to act in what is definitely one of the most difficult to read stories of faith ever told. And Hebrews 11.30, faith and action. God brought down the wall of Jericho. But the Israelites had to act according to some very specific directions before that would happen. So that leads us right into our case study. 
We may get out early today, so that's good. When it comes to the perfect example in the Bible, of course we think of Jesus Christ. He was perfect. But when we think of other characters in the Bible, what do we think of as good examples of faith? Who do you think of when you think of good examples of faith? Just mention a couple. Abraham. Lots of Abraham. Absolutely. Who else? Joshua and Caleb. Perfect. There's so many, really. Look at David, and in the New Testament. Peter. He didn't start out that way, did he? But he turned into one of the most incredible, strongest, courageous missionaries the planet will ever see. What about a woman? Rahab. Rahab. Wow. Right on. That is an excellent observation. Rahab. And that's exactly where we're going. <laughs> if I had a Heath bar, I'd give you the Marty Miller Heath bar award. But Marty loves Heath bars. <laughs> Ruth, of course, Ruth. Ruth. And there's kind of a connection with Rahab there, isn't it? Yeah, they both were in the Yep, yep, absolutely. You're absolutely right. And I, I, I'm, I was surprised you said Rahab. Yeah, because most times we go right past that, don't we? Um, I mean, as an example of faith, a prostitute? <laughs> That's what she's known as. Rahab the prostitute. So what we're going to do is open our Bibles to Joshua chapter 2. And at the same time, if you would, James chapter 2. Oh, did I lose it? No, there it is. Okay. Joshua chapter 2 and James chapter 2. And we'll start with Joshua. So in chapter 2, we're seeing that uh, Joshua has decided to send in two spies. The king of Jericho knows they're there. He locates them in the house of Rahab. But she had hidden them, uh, taken them up on the roof. And she sends the, the army of the king of Jericho on a wild goose chase. And they're on their way out. In verse 8, before the spies lay down for the night... She went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Bingo. That's exactly what the spies wanted to hear and that's exactly the report that they took back to Joshua. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, for when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. And it goes on to say that a pact is made. Uh, Rahab and her family are spared. But you notice that um, she had done several things already. She had hidden the spies. She had several actions. She sent the king of Jericho on a wild goose chase. And, and she already gave instructions to the spies how their escape would work. And they, in turn, in this pact, told her there's two things you've got to do. Number one, you've got to tie the scarlet cord in the window. Because when the wall of Jericho 
comes down, if that scarlet cord is there, you and yours will be saved. And that's point number two. The second thing she had to do was get her father and her mother and her brothers and sisters and all her children in her house and then tie that scarlet cord. So she had two things she had to do. And there's an agreement made. And then ultimately, they return to Joshua. The spies do. They make their way back. And they tell him, the Lord has surely, verse 24, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Okay. Rahab had faith. That Israeli army was out there, and it was going to take them down. And the Canaanites were about to suffer tremendously. She had faith that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. She made that pronouncement. She has that faith. And she began to act on that faith. And in that faith, she tied that scarlet cord. She gathered her family together. And she was saved because of her actions. Based on that faith. So if we go over to James chapter 2, verse 14. Starting at verse 14. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. That's not a good thing. Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over what? Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And that's a very strong word. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's, what? Friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and by faith alone or not faith alone? Not by faith alone. And that should be a shock to a lot of folks out there. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. That's some powerful words, in it? It is. You see, in the ESV, a person is justified by works and not... By faith alone. I think faith alone appears one time in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament. And this is it. But it's preceded by not. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead in the ESV, so also faith apart from works is dead. Deeds and works are synonyms and both appear in various translations. But notice, and in the same way. In the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works. It's amazing. 
Why did the Holy Spirit direct James to include Rahab, a prostitute, in the same breath and in our Bibles in the same paragraph as Abraham? One of the first persons we think of is Abraham, right? James lists Abraham side by side with Rahab, a prostitute, to affirm this. That justification. And what is justification? What is it? Not guilty? Acquitted? Um, you know, the characters in the Bible like Rahab. Yep. And David in his weaker moments give all of us hope. That's true. That's a really good comment. The comment is that Rahab the prostitute and, and David when he sinned. Moses killed the Egyptian. When, when we see the failures of man and then we see that, well, David was a man after God's own heart. We see that example. It gives us hope. That's a good comment. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to remember that Rahab's works and Abraham's works were done because of their faith. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. That, that we're, we don't follow checklists. There's not like a checklist in an appendix somewhere in the Bible and we have to check that off. That's not what it is. But faith will bring you to action. And she had faith in God, right? Had the prostitute. She, she confessed that and knew. Yeah, very good. Um, And John mentioned this earlier. I don't think you heard him. But uh, Rahab is in Matthew chapter 1. Did you know that? Yep, yeah, we know it. <laughs> we read that chapter in January every, every year. Um, yeah, she's mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy of Jesus. That gives us hope, doesn't it? To think she could be included there. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, it's just an incredibly beautiful thing for sinners to be purified and made uh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's actually where we'll, that's a good point. We're actually going to go right there. Uh, that what an amazing thing, amazing grace that God provides to us. That as sinners, we can be saved. And sometimes people don't think that. But yes, anyone could be saved. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, she's in the genealogy. She went on to live with the Israelites. You know that too, right? Joshua chapter 6, verse 25. She went on to live with the Israelites. We see her there as well. We see her in Matthew chapter 1. Um, we see that Rahab married Salmon, who gave us... Boaz. And who did Boaz marry? A Moabite? Ruth. And then here came who? Obed? Jesse? Right? David? Right down the line. Until we get to the very last words of Matthew chapter 1. Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Rahab is also included, of course, in Hebrews 11, verse 31. She did not perish with those who were disobedient because she wasn't disobedient. She acted, and that's one of your points you made. She acted because she acted, that is, in helping the spies, she did not perish. Okay. So, I think we already answered this question. Have you ever thought of Rahab in a very negative sense as you're flying through the Old Testament in Joshua 2, Rahab the prostitute, and put her upside your mind? Barbara, you have not. You caught it, yeah? But have you done? I know I have. I'm guilty. I'd be like, Rahab the prostitute? All right, whatever. Get me to the spies in Joshua and the, and the Battle of Jericho. But we do have that because of what she had done. Was she still a prostitute, you think? I don't know. But she certainly had been a prostitute. Is our judgment God's judgment? 
No. Are our ways God's ways or are God's ways our ways? No. They're higher. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive what? Mercy. Yes. So was Rahab saved? That's the question. Was she saved? Well, probably so, right? But as we just said, God knows. He knows the complete story of Rahab. But John was indicating that too. Amazing that she could be saved considering her profession. And that's what makes me think of amazing grace too, John, of how amazing God is. Yes. Right. More so than most any. Yeah. And I think that that's the important point. They, here they were like the dogs. You know, you don't feed the dogs on the table. Don't feed the dogs, the Gentiles. And they came with great grace. And to me, that's just beautiful. Beautiful stories and inspiring and gives us hope. Ruth and, and Rahab. We saw it last week from God's creation to his faithfulness, to his love to his mercy and his willingness to forgive and forget. Sometimes we don't think about that. But we're told he is willing to forgive us and even forget. God is amazing and so is his grace. Yes. Bathsheba. Because he's king. David and Bathsheba, and so. And God blessed her. And God blessed Bathsheba. Yeah. After some punishment for David's. Yeah. Yeah, another good example of faith. She didn't have a choice because he was King David. Most importantly, of course, I uh, thank you. I love all your comments. Appreciate it. Um, I, of course, think about how Jesus um, has given the opportunity for everyone to be saved. But they must have what kind of faith? An obedient faith, actions that we spoke of. Rahab had a faith, and God used her in such a way that she believed that, but believed in and took action. If we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the evidence is overwhelming, he died and was buried and was resurrected the third day, if you believe that and believe in Jesus, then, of course, you will have that faith and you will, where we began at the beginning, trust and obey, for there's no other way. Of course, Rahab's story, as I mentioned earlier, is completely known by God. Yeah, I think, I think there's a really good chance she was saved. Uh, tremendous story. And to wrap up today, a couple of things come to mind. And John had just mentioned it earlier. I, I know, I know there are people in this world that honestly don't think they can be saved. They did too much. Their minds are too eaten up with all the things they did in their life. I mean, how many times was Rahab a prostitute? It probably wasn't one time. And there are people that have suffered or done things so wrong that they say to themselves, I give up. I quit. How can I, this kind of a sinner, be saved? If you know someone like that, or if you've ever felt that way, you're wrong. With Jesus, anyone can be saved. No matter what their past was all about, no matter what you've done, or how many times you've done it, an obedient faith will lead you to the salvation that's in Jesus. Yes, Tyrone. 1 Timothy 1.15 Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. 
Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul wrote that. 1 Timothy 1.15. Jesus Christ came into the world. That was, his, that was his function, to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am the worst. A trustworthy saying, and that the word trustworthy is only? This is a trustworthy saying. Jesus Christ came world to save sinners with whom I am chief. Okay. Used five times. Trustworthy saying, just used five times. Thank you. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.15. If you know someone that feels that way, that they're lost forever, they don't have to be. Assure them that you have to start making right decisions and right actions. And, um, and also let them know it's never too late to start making right decisions. To place your faith in that and to act. And another thing about Rahab that I'm guilty of, I mean, I judged her when I read this all my life. But I do know, judge not, that you be not judged. Now, the world uses that out of context in horrible ways, really, to say everything's okay, and it's not. That's not what it means. But I do know this, only God is qualified to know and judge. So we have to be very careful to judge someone's past, don't we? It just may be judging someone who's been forgiven by God, used by God, whose sins have been forgotten. So be careful. You shouldn't be judging people on their past. And please remember this, that obedient faith must lead to a change of mind, and that's called repentance. There is something for all of us to do. No matter how old you are, no matter what you've done, God can use you and God can save you. If you don't believe that, it's just possible someday, you may be able to ask Rahab herself. We are a couple of minutes early. Is there any comments, anybody, any other comments? Anyone? Great comments from right here all the way up to the left. Thank you all very much for participating. We're really glad you're here. The exciting part now is that the kids are not out yet. And if we hurry, we can beat the kids to the donuts. So that's it. Thank you all very much for being here.